Uh, this is the third collaboration between the ART and the Humanities Center at Harvard, and we're looking forward to many more projects together in the future. Uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, tonight's topic is Prometheus Bound, uh, which is playing in our other space across on the other side of Harvard Yard at Oberon. Uh, we're currently in technical rehearsals. Uh, we're just about to open that show. If you want to continue uh, your experience this afternoon, there is a performance this evening. Uh, and we're also on the stage for our production of Ajax, which is also performing this evening. So we're in the middle of a, a Greek uh, festival here at the ART. Uh, I'd like to just introduce uh, our panelists and then turn things over uh, to Homi. Uh, to my right, uh, Homi Baba is the director of the Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard. Susanna Serkin is the deputy director of Physicians for Human Rights. Steven Sater is the lyricist and writer of Prometheus Bound. Diane Paulus is the ART's artistic director and the director of Prometheus Bound. And uh, Jacqueline Baba is the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Lecturer at the Harvard Law School. So thank you all so much for being with here, and Homie, I'll turn things over to you. Hello, it's a great pleasure being here this evening, and thank you so much for coming. This is a rather strange time, five in the evening, um, and uh, we are aware of the fact that this has actually given us a certain advantage. We have an intimate audience, and if you would like to come closer in so that we can do this seminar style, it would be, uh, thank you so much if you come in. Yeah, this is, I think would be, be a great advantage to the discussion. Now, um, I wanted to thank our colleagues at the ART for their many uh, spirited collaborations with us. We find ourselves, um, as Brian said, in the midst of a Greek season. And I think it might be worthwhile spending some time asking ourselves and discussing amongst ourselves and in, of course with your cooperation why the Greeks return so much in modern life. Greek theater returns again and again but Greek thought returns. Just to mention three th modern thinkers who've been profoundly shaped um, by, or four of them, I can think, now I can add another one, Nietzsche, Freud, Hannah Arendt, Karl Popper, and this is only just to, make, just the, to, to skim the surface. The Greeks return again and again, and it is interesting to ask ourselves why this happens. What is their recurrent uh, relevance? And I think that uh, I'd, I'd like to suggest as we start that one of the reasons for this <clears throat> is the way in which Greek tragedy um, sees that there is an unresolvable problem between the circumstances, the necessities, the historical and public pressures under which we live and our own psychic, emotional, affective, and imaginative drives. So this is not a problem between the private and the public that can easily be resolved. This is a problem that has in each generation, in each period, in each art form, in each life, to be thought again and again to be negotiated. And I think that is one of the reasons why, in modern times, where there is such an emphasis on the contingency of present life, on the asymmetries, on the, sing on the, uh, on the discordant uh, forms of life, on contradictions, on problems, all these things that constitute modernity, the desire to actually deal with contradiction, to deal with incommensurable situations, doesn't surprise me that in that context, the Greeks return to us with a profound force. Despite the fact that we no longer have the same sense of necessity of which we hear so much in this play. We don't have that same sense of necessity. We don't have that same sense of ancestral genealogical determinism. We don't have that anymore. 
But at the same time, we have other forces that present themselves to us with, that, with, a, with a similar ineluctable sense of, um, their, of, of their solidity, of their, of their deterministic force on our lives. And one of the issues that determinism of that kind, of the Greek kind or of our own kind, really militates against is the idea of democracy. If you accept those necessities, then democratic transformations and change are that much more difficult to imagine. And I think with Prometheus, one of the real issues is how you deal with what seems like an unmovable, unshakable, tyrannical power. The greatness of the play as represented yesterday or is in the original, is its deep understanding how tyrannical power works. There's a wonderful passage <clears throat> about power and paranoia that once you accept the word of power and feel that there is no way to move against it, to, no way to interpret it, then what it creates is a kind of paranoic haze in your life. And that always binds you again to the, to the, to the forces of the tyrannical power you wish to push against. Now, the other great um, issue in uh, Greek tragedy, and in fact, Something that I think was rather creatively pointed out yesterday was the fact that the way to overcome power is not necessarily always to focus on it and simply to respond to it, to get caught up in the, in, in the glare of power. If you only think of power and you only face it, you only think of overcoming the state in a direct way, you get caught in its own power games, in its own dynamics. And I think what, one of the things we saw yesterday was how very often in such a tyrannical situation, it is those who are marginal, women's movements, women movements of other kinds, minoritarian movements, that somehow prevail. And they prevail because they are a shared ethical, moral, and political sentiment. And I think that this is where yesterday's play linked so well to what we have been seeing in the Middle East um, <coughs> and North Africa over the past couple of months. That it's, you know, it is not the organized, um, the more traditionally organized forces of change, but it is the way in which ripple effects, contingencies, small groups, the new technologies can actually bring people together. And it's with this that I actually want to end, that if we see the new technologies as cultural forms and cultural forces, rather as we would see rhetoric in the, in the Greek world, or rather as we would see theater, that these are then mise-en-scene, things like uh, technology is not simply a mode of communication. It is something more. It's something that has the power of creating new communities, of constituting new emotions and new affects, of inspiring new forms of action. And I think we should see contemporary technology, whether we are for it or against it, very much as a kind of cultural and aesthetic order of our time, not simply as a mode of easy mechanical reproduction and communication. And I think in that sense, uh, this production comes to us at a very important and indeed even symptomatic time. So before I ask um, Stephen and Diane to say a few words, I want to put a question to them, which is a very obvious one. In many of the revivals, re-inscriptions, re translations of traditional work here at the ART, 
we often find the power of the music and, the, and musicality is a very important a, uh, is a very important creative force. And yesterday it seemed to me that the music was loud. There were times you could not understand the words. There was, I mean, there was no way that I could understand even half of the actual lyrics themselves. But that didn't seem to me to matter because I think what you touched on was something very profound about the audience in Greek theater, which is not that you, that you, which is that you do not simply get the message in a rational, rationalistic, deliberative form, but it's the way in which theater involves the whole body. And you could see people responding to the music even when they didn't get the words. That that bodily movement itself is capable of creating something like a catharsis. Too often we think of a catharsis as a mental quality or a mental form, reflective mental form. Of course there, there is that to it. But I think what you bring back using the contemporary music that you do is the actual affective corporeal incorporation of the whole body in the practice of performance. And I thought that that was actually particularly well done. And you know, Maybe I'm going a little bit deaf. I'm certainly going old. I couldn't quite grasp the words. I couldn't quite, there was, sometimes the music was too loud for me. But that's the way I interpreted it, is an incorporation of the self and the bodily self into the action and the motion of drama. Is that, have I got it right or am I just making up for my own infirmities? I'll, I'll start with a little response to that. Um, I, I think it's, actually not our intention not to understand the words. We're working on that, and we worked on it today in rehearsal. Um, but you're right. Uh, actually, Josh Rubenstein, the head of Amnesty, was talking to me last night. He saw the show, and he said, it's like those favorite rock albums. You have to listen to the songs, you know. 20 times you really get the lyrics, and you've got to look at the liner notes. You know, how many times when you experience rock pop music, you know, it is something else that's hitting you, some other kind of vibration, some other kind of viscerality. And yes, we love the lyrics, but in a way we receive the lyrics through our personalization with a song, our repeated listening, our reading. Um, the, the larger answer is I think Stephen and I have shared an interest in Greek theater and what our fantasy of what it must have been like in fifth century Athens to experience these plays and what we do know about theater at that time and theater as ritual and theater as not just a mental endeavor but truly uh, uh, something that you pass through your body and space with. Um, and I think uh, when we made a decision to incorporate rock music into the show, it felt like, well, what is then the world of this rock music? And there was something about the uh, form that you find at Oberon where about 170 of the audience stand. There are others that can sit because we have about almost 300 capacity. So some people can sit, but most of the audience is standing. And that um, seems radical in the theater because we usually don't stand at the theater unless you have standing room at the back. But really, you know, the best, closest seats are standing. Uh, but certainly that's the form that we experience other forms of live communion and, you know, whether it's at a rock concert or kind of different environments. So this was kind of our homage, I think, to what we thought and felt, and certainly this play, and I'm gonna pass it to Stephen now, but this play gets a bit of a bad rap. It gets the play with no action. It's the play with the guy chained to the rock and everybody says that, you know, nothing happens in it. But for me, that seems so strange because if you're chained to a rock, it's because you have so much unbelievable energy that you literally have to be withheld uh, in, in, in force with chains to, to restrain one. That to me, I, I, I felt I wanted to transmit that energy. And as Stephen has said, I promised last night, he said to me, and he reminds me, in many ways for him, the play is the mind of Prometheus, the activity of the mind. And what we learned so powerfully from Susanna Serkin was uh, you know, this idea of, when you have prisoners of conscience, they survive in their mind. 
That's how they survive, because the physical torture is unbearable. So how do you survive it? So the idea that the entire event is in a way a projection of this hero's mind and that we as the audience are experiencing that energy that he is tapping into to survive is the theatrical event. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> you know, it's so interesting because I was reminded listening to you of the, the quotation at the beginning of your book from Heidegger where you talk about the ancient Greeks talk about boundaries as not only an end but as at the beginning of the presencing of something new. And I think in a way it was something like that that I hoped I sensed in um, well, 2006, 2007, when I began working on this, which was honestly in the midst of the Iraq war, which I felt was an unjust war. And I, it brought up the play to me so strongly because I think what this play has to say at its heart to me is that you know to call a crime just doesn't make it just. And to call a, you know, because God says, you know, um, Milton's Satan says, not just, not God. You know, um, Eskel says something more radical than that. He actually says he's not just, but he is God. I mean, it's, it's a really radical thought. And I think it's really interesting that you point out um, that our, our production should end up becoming, I think that has everything to do with Diane and her genius as a director, but that our production should become so visceral and so, so much engage the body when it's, this is a play whose radical nature is so, is so much to celebrate the power of the mind. You know, in, is it on civil disobedience, Ron, where, where um, Thoreau talks about, you know, you can put me in prison, but then all you can imprison is my body. You can't imprison my spirit. And that's what this play says. You can lock me up. You can grip me in the iron hand of force, but my mind has the power to resist it. That's what's so radical. Diane's bringing back to things I've said, but that, you know, Aeschylus chooses to begin this play not with the war on the Titans, the coup d'etat that put Zeus on the throne, and not with the thieving of fire, but with this, this, solitaire, this man being locked in solitary confinement, this Titan, if you will, being locked away from all civilization for what seems like an indefinite future. And we go into the power of his mind, the drama of his mind, and watch what it means to resist. And we've really focused on that in our adaptation, which is what this is, of this plan, this new musical we've been creating. And I think that um, from the very beginning, from the very first conversation I had with Diane, we both remember it, we said, you know, Diane had read my translation, was very excited by it. And I had wanted in my translation to recreate the power, the visceral nature of the language in Greek, in English. And Diane said she heard music, or she asked me if I heard music, and I said yes. And she said she heard rock and roll, and I felt the same thing. Because rock and roll has been, for generations now, the voice of rebellion, of defiance in our culture, the cry against the deaf heavens, if you will. And we had the very rare fortune to, um, to get the composer of our dreams involved, Serge Tankian with System of a Down. And I think what he's written for this show is just so remarkable and varied and crosses so many musical forms. It's not merely rock music. There's really such a range of things he's doing. And we had the great fortune also to involve Stephen Petronio as our choreographer, who's, this is his first experience in the theater. He's had his own dance company for 25 years and his dance is ecstatic. It takes the body and I don't know, creates stories in space with the body. And I think Diane, from the beginning, we went to see, remember we went to see Serge's concert, and we were so fascinated watching this mosh pit and these young men being so involved in this production. And Diane said, I think that's how we want to stage the show. And um, so, you know, for me as the lyricist, to go back where Diane began, <laughs> I wish everyone could hear every word. And... Um, <laughs> I, you know, in my, I did a, another musical with another rock musician, Spring Awakening, and we actually brought the band much way down, and we really worked and worked and worked on the audibility of the lyrics, and here we've been working on that, but I also, we have a kind of music that's all about that sound of the rock music, and so how do you, how do we figure that out, you know, so, um, so much of the experience is having that sort of deafening cry of the music hit you, sort of assault you with its cry. So, so I don't know. It's a problem we're continuing to work on, or, or it's a... I'm, 
was not putting you on the mat for it at all. Yeah. I was just yeah. saying that it creates the way I could understand it, yeah. not understanding the words, was the orgiastic nature yeah. of ritual theater of a certain kind where effectively you take in the theater too. Your whole yeah. body moves with it. It's, I mean, I, I always, <clears throat> you know, I, I am a huge fan of Arto and the theater of cruelty and this idea of, you know, for Arto, you know, a, a, a form of pity and terror that you experience in his idea of the theater, which is catharsis, you experience the cruelty so that then you actually don't go out in life and enact the cruelty. That's what the theater does. It, it's like a, uh, an exorcism of that. Um, and I, I always think in my own way, like, bass speakers are Artodian, you know, because it's like vibration, you know, that goes in your body. A kind of active yoga. <laughs> yeah. Susanna, I wanted to ask you uh, a question coming out of what they said. That, you know, you can imprison my body, but you can't imprison my mind. Prisoners of conscience, pris people who have been tortured. How true is that? At what point does the mind give way? Uh, and all of your work is very much aimed at, you know, at making sure that that, that yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's interesting, Diane mentioned that the survivors, those who survive whole, have incredible resilience of the mind. Uh, certainly they may also have resilience of the body, but the the intent of torture especially, and I think you see a lot of, one of your <laughs> actors talked about, uh, almost apologetically last night after we saw the show, of the, what he called the fetishism of torture in the production, which, you know, I think it's, it is Artodian. I mean, it's, you sort of see this all enacted in a kind of a ritualistic, symbolic way, and it's, it's quite horrifying. And, it, and as an audience member, you're not quite sure how to respond, but... Um, the symbolism of the various acts that happen in the choreography of, of, of uh, Stephen Petronio are, you know, definitely uh, evocative of real torture that goes on now, as well as the, 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 the words, the poetry, which describe, I mean, it's quite uh, stunning how, mu how much and how contemporary, tragically, truly tragically, um, this play is, because uh, there, in the Aeschylus version, also there is, you know, there is talk of how uh, Prometheus is forced to stand and not being allowed to bend his knees and not being allowed to sleep. And you know, <laughs> Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib. I mean, enhanced interrogation. And then there's clearly, you know, electric shock and the the pure shackling, etc. Extreme pain. And um, so, those who, in our experience, who survive. Uh, and especially those who survive, as many of them as writers or artists, and are able to produce something um, extraordinary, having come out of the, this pain, uh, very often have an incredible resilience and strength of mind. Um, you see, jo is that Josh? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, no, I thought, I thought that was Josh in the distance. But Amnesty International has, has written, as well as Physicians for Human Rights, a lot about you know, what physical pain is like for torture survivors and how extreme it is. And as I said to, to your cast uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we've, we've had many torture survivors who say, I would rather have died than suffer that pain. I would rather be dead when I think about those moments. And yet somehow uh, the human spirit, uh, in many cases, not all, uh, can overcome. And, but I was thinking, uh, when you're asking this question, uh, Homie, about uh, the character of Io, who, who, who talks about the mental torment and being deranged, and that's you know, in, the, in the play very much, that her suffering, presumably her rape, um, and the, the pursuit of her uh, endlessly to the ends of the earth, etc., has caused her mind to go. Um, and, of course, we see that. And, and, you know, uh, there are people now all over the world, in almost every country of the world, who specialize in uh, mental rehabilitation of torture survivors and political prisoners. So, um, you know, we, we see the full range. And um, the play is very powerful um, to those of us who have worked with uh, torture survivors. 
other than the question of torture, there is also the larger issue of a law, whatever that law is, and law can be an ass, and law can often be unjust, and there's this sort of conflict between justice and the law, fairness and the law. Jackie, did you think that that was a, did that come out to you as a, this idea which is so central in, in Greek tragedy, that although you have necessity, although you have the law, the law is so limited, and what is justice, what is fairness, is something beyond its reach. Did that, did, you, did, did that sort of make an impact on you yesterday? I thought that um, there certainly was a sharp contrast between power or authority or the ability to impose norms on the one hand and the sort of spirit of freedom and idealism on the other. Um, so in a sense, you could say that that first cluster was represented by a notion of law. I think what was so interesting about the play for me was that um, it really captured the um, sometimes nearly crazy courage and idealism of people who sacrifice so much. I mean, in this case, I was just looking at the script today. Um, you know, Prometheus gets into all this trouble because he can't desist in his love of mankind. Now, why should he care about mankind? He's a god, you know. And he says afterwards that what he actually did was to... Um, uh, he really gave them hope. He gave mankind hope. He gave them fire, gave them a sense of, of, of hope, of, of, of escape from doom. He says, uh, I spared those born to die, the journey to Hades in utter annihilation. I spared the creatures of a day, the foresight of their doom. And I think that, for me, was this kind of resonance with so much of the work that those of us who are involved in human rights are engaged in, that on the one hand, there's this... this really unquenchable um, conviction to do the right thing, come what may, whatever the sacrifices, and, uh, and, and often the sacrifices are absolutely unspeakably enormous. Um, and, and I thought that really came across uh, beautifully in the production. Um, what I thought also was, was very interesting was, um, in a way, the, the complicated reaction of the public, which I think having a standing audience and having this, I found, extremely powerful and wonderful music. Um, I'm so much younger than Homie, so it wasn't deafening for me at all. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I found that actually, that kind of energizing and engrossing and, and kind of strangely, weirdly, but inescapably enjoyably enjoyable music, that was really interesting because, of course, that's what crowds are often like in situations. If you think of public hangings, you know, there's this kind of lascivious, sexualized lust about, about this um, horrific performance. That's why these things are public often, because people at some level enjoy them. And there certainly were, I think there were members of the audience who were kind of sort of torn between thinking, oh my God, this is terrible, awful pain, and then thinking, Wow, this is cool, and I'm actually enjoying this. And and it was a, a strange, a strange emotion, but it was very much there for me throughout because I myself was kind of inhabiting those those two spaces. Um, I mean, just the last point I'd make, going back to to something that Susanna said, is that you know there really are at least these two polar responses to very, very serious human rights violations. One is resilience, and one is you know what is could be called a sort of uh, pathological response of, of, of trauma or, 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 or some form of, of, of madness and, and inability to cope and or even, you know, total collapse leading to suicide and so on. And you see these very often. I've spent a lot of time doing uh, refugee um, representation and, of course, among refugees are the archetypal sort of ca case in point of people who have have had to flee because of, of serious human rights violations. And you do see these two, these two types of responses. And I think that we actually here at Harvard, in fact, and my, my colleague is in the audience, Jane Unruh, who works with me, we have the Scholars at Risk program, which brings scholars, because we are a scholarly institution. So we bring scholars who face persecution to Harvard to have sort of respite 
from the trials and tribulations of you know, oppressive regimes that they have to encounter. And we too have seen exactly these two responses. On the one hand, we've had composers who spend their time here composing and being tremendously creative. And on the other hand, we've had people who we've had to, you know, help find psychiatric help for and who, who can barely kind of go out of the house. And so in our own midst, we, we experience this. And so I think the play really um, kind of... Uh, sets the stage, as, as, as we've been saying, for something very, very contemporary. Um, even today, for those of you who heard <laughs> NPR and heard about this dreadful case of this American uh, convert to Islam who, who was basically wrongly arrested and, and brutalized by, by the previous administration, one of the ways in which he was brutalized was precisely by being kind of incarcerated and kept awake for hours on end as a, as a form of torture to get him to confess to things. So these, these uh, experiences from, from, from um, centuries ago are, are unfortunately really within our midst even today. You know, you started talking about one of the great themes uh, of, of Greek tragedies, even which is war. War, I mean, you know, one of the great themes. And in fact, even in this protest of Prometheus, there is a kind of war uh, going on. You know, there is a there is a war of there's a war of minds, there's a war of values, there's a war of uh, of, 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 of war of justice. Are there? What is a just war? When are wars just? When can you say this is not a good war, but this is a uh, a war that ethically one can support in a way in which, you're right, the move into Iraq was not. I, I don't know if I'm a good person to answer this question about just wars because I'm not sure I... I'm not sure I'm the best representative for this, this question. Well, yeah, we don't want you to be representative. I, yeah, but I, be I don't personally believe there is any just war, so I don't believe there's... Any, but. but what I meant about um, about this war that uh, Bush declared was that he seemed to set himself above the law in in declaring war, above the the interests of the people, above the United Nations, above you know the the Council of Other Nations. He, he seemed he was hell bent on creating a war um, for whatever set of personal and private reasons. What what's um, I'm a Buddhist. I don't. I don't believe in taking human life, and I don't believe in you know that there's any just cause for war. So, yes, I was making a distinction, as I think you can make a distinction between just and unjust laws. This is the theme of Antigone. Right. You know, this is the theme. This is what Martin Luther King sounded again and again in jail, and he would say, you know, he would cite Augustine saying, you know, there's when a, a law is unjust, it's no law, and a, a man proves himself more just by standing up against an unjust law and being willing to, to, um, to experience lifetime incarceration, which is, which is Prometheus. Um, I understand the reasons for going to war, um, but I, I personally am not, you know. I can talk about war as a I mean, this may be, this is not a direct answer to your question, Homie, but for me, watching this play at this very time, it's the play to me is much more about uh, a different kind of war, which is the struggle for democracy that you started talking about. And it's so resonant in this play. And I just wanted to share, I mean, and there's a continuum when the rule of law is not respected, which is what connects your feeling about the Iraq war with. Uh, what we're thinking about now as we watch <clears throat> what's going on in Bahrain and in Egypt and in Libya and so forth. And people who literally, I mean, it's, it's so striking that this very week, this play is, is opening here and the issue of fire and bringing fire to the earth is, is, is strangely resonant in the way that the um, self-immolation in Tunisia using fire as a weapon, in fact, launched. And one of the, I think, challenges of the play um, in terms of the sort of deeper 
contradictions that you pointed out. I'm a human rights activist. I like to see things a little less in contradiction, just right and wrong, and we're right and they're wrong. But, um, but is, is this issue of Prometheus giving to humans the very thing that can actually allow humans to make war in, in, as well? It's something we, we can't not think about. It's a power that is unleashed and, um, and so forth. But I just... He's giving human beings that, uh, a hand in their own destiny. Yes, that's of course, to, to be agents of their own destiny. And to that's, make their own that's decisions. What democracy, and one decision might be yes. in the protection of democracy to declare war. And that's what democracy yeah. is about. And I just wanted to share my own experience, my first experience with this play, which is I lived in Athens, Greece, throughout high school during a military dictatorship. And this play was banned at the beginning. It was meant to be put on in 1967 in the summer festival in Greece. And it was banned by the junta, the dictators who took over, because of its obvious message. And um, very shortly after that, uh, actually a couple of years after that, the regime put out uh, decrees banning and censoring all sorts of writers, especially you know, Marx and Bertolt Brecht, et cetera, but also Aeschylus, many works by Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes, um, Aristophanes because they were considered subversive, dangerous, and so forth. And so what happened when I was there as a teenager were these underground performances of some of these plays. And I remember being taken by my father to an underground performance of Prometheus Bound as a, an act of rebellion. And um, I, I found in recent weeks, as I was trying to remember that time for myself, because I was a, you know, a high school kid, um, there have been some fascinating studies of the way in which Greek tragedy was, was actually a force for the Greek populace through the poetry, through these words, through the, these productions, many of which did involve the full body, actually, because it was at the time of early experimental theater, actually, in Europe. Um, a, as a way to cohere a message of opposition, and people actually went to the big performances of some of these plays that were allowed en masse, like to Epidaurus in Greece, as a way of protest, and when certain lines would be read that were talking about freedom and opposing the gods who were interpreted as <laughs> the dictators of that time, um, they would applaud and interrupt the play, and that was their only way of expressing themselves. And, you know, then you think of today, what, um, what are we meant to do? And the way that, that Diane and the ART have so brilliantly brought together Amnesty International into this production to, to you know, be the Greek citizens, in effect, mm -hmm. I think, um, to say, you know, okay, you're watching this, it's terrifying, it, it's evoking um, pity and fear, and there's a catharsis, but are you a bystander? Are you just echoing this end, or are you going to go out and actually do something, having, having heard this? I hope I'm not jumping the gun on our discussion. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a Buddhist, I don't believe in guns. <laughs> Dan, can I ask you whether, sorry, did you want to say something to you? No, I was just, but I don't want to interrupt you, ask them to, I was just gonna say that for me, um, this play, which is, as I've said often, is, to me is the most searing indictment of tyranny ever written. To me, it's also a radical critique of democracy, of the de democratic system as it is, because it was written at the birth of Western democracy. Right. And this tends to be explained away as Aeschylus sort of demonizing the old monarchy, which I, I think no playwright worth his salt. We wouldn't be reading this play 2,500 years later if you were writing about something that had already was over by the time he you know, was writing. Um, but I think that he felt, um, you know, as Socrates did, that there's, there's, a, there's a danger inherent in this idea of democracy, which is giving ourselves over, giving our power over to this beast of society, this tyrant beast of society, which, you know, that when public opinion begins to determine policy, then private interests can begin to sway the course of justice, which we see again and again. But then how would you constitute policy? What would policy be if it were not part of some representative process? I suppose that, you know, there's, I, I think he's talking about the danger within a representative process in which conscience is not the guide, you know, which, in which private interests, you know, rule, which 
certainly is what we see happening in our, you know, our legislation. Well, that's actually a very interesting point about the, the difference that the uh, Greeks made between the polis and the oikos, the private and the public. But on the other hand, we also admire these plays because there is something about the psychic drive, there is something about the private, there is something about the personal, there is something about the singular, which cannot help but enter into the world of the social or the plural. Yeah. But Dan, I want to ask you something. Um, um, in, in response to Susanna, you know, the great, the ability of the Greek people to come to these great performances, the great populace in Athens or wherever you were living, and to actually repeat these words depends on a tradition of theater that has a vast popular appeal. It depends on an educational system that supports that. It depends on a kind of cultural discourse that runs through the country. Does that, is that the case here and now in this our America? Or indeed, by bringing in the rock music, by bringing in these things, are you attempting to give people who may not know certain kinds of literary or cultural texts, an actual way of getting into these, uh, into these citadel, citadels of culture and taste. Right, it's, it's this tricky <clears> thing <throat> of, um, of understanding what is uh, culture or what is theater. And I think when I think about what, what is ritual for not the small few who go to the theater, because there are a, a, a very you know, small proportion of the population for whom theater is a ritual, and they will go and engage. But for whatever reasons, would, would be a subject of another panel. That's not as systematic in America, perhaps, as it was in 5th century Athens. I think that's a lot because the theater wasn't integrated into their lives as much. It was not as civic and religious and ritual and and celebratory, you know, I mean, back in the Greek time, you would have these Greek tragedies, but you'll, you, you wouldn't just go see a Greek tragedy. First, you were there, and you were voting on who was the best playwright, and then you'd stay for the Seder play, and you have a party. I mean, you know, it, it, it wasn't just the one-off, I'm going to go get my culture tonight and buy a ticket to a play. It was, it was, like, integrated into your life. So in my way, let's talk about a different demographic, getting a wider, more popular audience into the theater. I look at certain forms of rock concerts. And let's take Serge Tankian, who's a, I don't know what he calls himself, alternative rock, punk, you know, social activist, writes for Amnesty. When I, when we went to his concert and I started reading his lyrics and I start looking at these people, when we went to this club in New York and I wanted to go in there and someone grabbed me and said, you don't want to go there, come on the balcony and watch it because it's going to be intense. And I went up and the, the behavior of pe the, the, the catharsis, the participation, the chanting back, that audience knowing the lyrics and raising their arms. I looked at that and I remember saying to her, I was like, that, I bet you the Greek theater looked more like that. I just had a sense that, th so there is behavior that way, but I think we can, we tend to, we've tend to say this is, act that's rock behavior, that's rock concerts, and theater's over <laughs> here. And I'm not trying to say theater can't be what maybe we are more used to it, you know, in an auditorium where you sit and there's no rock music, absolutely. But I'm just trying to open up the continuum in my own way to say this, this is theater. I mean, I, I've said this so many times that I think, you know, in a thousand years, the history books are going to look back at the 21st century, 20th century. And yeah, there were those regional theaters in those plays, but there was the professional wrestling mo movement, and there were rock concerts. I mean, you know, they're going to look at those other forms and call them theater, you know, from the 10,000-foot view a thousand years from now. Those are going to get looked at as shamanistic, ritual, live events, the way I fantasize about, you know, whatever, the mysteries at Eleusis or other things that went on that were theater and ritual 2,500 years ago. Well, I want to put just one last question, then open up to the audience. And I'm trying to pick up on a number of things, on the ethics of individual aspiration and courage, mm. central to this play, on the energy of the energy and the, and, and the hope that downtrodden 
people give each other by being together. And th this is also for me a metaphor of the theater, of a certain kind of theater, by people coming together. This is why they change the, uh, bef you know, one of the, one of the small causes of the French Revolution, as somebody once argued, was the way in which the theater had changed just before. People sat next to each other in a very different kind of arrangement than previous. Then the whole issue of democracy, mm. the question of culture. I want to put this together and uh, say that when I saw the play yesterday and I thought, you know, <clears throat> it was about something that we want to see because it's inspiring, but we want to avoid this situation. We don't want this situation to occur. And I thought, well, really for us, some notion of an active civil society is one of the best things we have to prevent the sort of situation that we both admired and deplored yesterday. And I just want to fling that around to you, you know, the notion of civil society. And then I thought, maybe if we have a very active civil society, we'll have no theater. We'll have no theater of cruelty. We'll have no, maybe we won't have any theater at all. Maybe we'll have no literature. Uh, but of course, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only half serious there. But I wanted to, that's what I took away, you know, and, and for, for the present the need, the profound need of civil society and how indeed in its first steps what's happening in my view in Egypt now mm. is an attempt to reconstitute a civil society which was very strong at one point mm -hmm. in that society and I think that's what these youth movements are really about in the fullest sense. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if anybody had anything to say about that and then we could move on. I think one of the things that's so interesting <laughs> is that uh, the notion of civil society and how civil society organizes is really being challenged right now because I think these uh, struggles that uh, we are witnessing, you know, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Oman, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Iran, I mean, who knows? Um, Italy, are, one hopes. Are, are using uh, very new and revolutionary forms of, um, of, uh, of communication and organizing. So gone are the days when one, you know, had to go out and leaflet at six in the morning to get people to come to a demonstration or to alert them to something. You know, you send a tweet and within half an hour, 45 minutes, you can convene a really massive group. And so I, I don't think this means that there's not going to be theater or that there's not going to be convening moments where people, you know, um, enjoy or uh, are, are stimulated by, by artistic um, uh, and creative um, performances. But I think it does mean that um, civil society activism is being increasingly democratized. So it, it's, it's really, really accessible and it's becoming more and more accessible, for example, to very young people who previously would not have been targeted and would have not, not have been part, necessarily been part of these sort of movements. So, um, and I think that in a way that has a wonderful resonance in the play where you actually, where in a way the whole feeling of the play is very, very young. The music is, I mean, you know, the, 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 the responses anyway to the music and the whole physicality of the play is, is very much about, about youth. And so I think there's a really interesting resonance there between the way in which a kind of more youthful civil society is now being put on the map, you know, not the kind of more middle-aged civil society that uh. maybe used to be the, 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 the kind of focus, or not middle-aged, but sort of the slightly older uh, civil society that used to be the focus of, 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 of political activism and so on, but it's but, a com completely different constituency, and the play, I think, really picks that up very but well. But I think people who were involved in the issues on civil society and the new technology talk about the digital commons. They see a continuity and an intensification of the democratic impulse is not a contradiction of them. So that's why I feel so young. <laughs> now, I think what's interesting about going back to the Greeks and going back 2,500 years and bringing this language in a fresh way, in a way that speaks to contemporary to us today, here, now, is that we are carrying on a conversation over, you know, Facebook and Twitter that's causing, literally causing revolutions. At the same time, we are repeating words that people 2,500 years ago who were experiencing 
some things very similar and, and struggling for something very similar. And we're connecting so in time and in space. And I think when you, and, and that's what I think is the challenge of, you know, here we're, we could be complacent here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We read about it in the paper. But so what theater does uh, and or this collective conversation over the social media when you can't convene because you would be shot, as in Tripoli today, um, you know, we are bringing voices together and gaining strength from one another. And I think one of the most powerful messages of the play is when it says, you know, what did Prometheus, Prometheus says, what did I do? I brought blind hope. And, you know, it's this infusion of hope that we get through music, dance, uh, these ancient words brought, made fresh by, by your amazing lyrics, and through this Twitter conversation. And so wherever, it's this bringing together of voices that I find extremely necessary and powerful to change the world. And that's what human rights organizations do, and that's what civil society uh, can do. Thank you very much. Let's turn to the audience. Yes, yes, please. Will you introduce yourself? Is there a mic? Thank you. That was that was wonderful. I have a question regarding uh, what you had to say about civil society and active society, and I'd like to throw this from the perspective of whether you see civil society or, the, or active society necessarily being tantamount to a democracy, or are there other systems that you might consider? And I'm, if I go back to my own country of India, for example, at a time when you had Pax Britannica, where you had civil society on the one hand, I mean, a very active society, but nonetheless under hegemonic control of a particular kind, how does that work? And let's look at the lineaments of a, the of a theatrical performance in that context. What if there wasn't a proscenium, but you could actually take to the street? If you could actually have street theater, would theater change accordingly um, in, a, in, a, in a place like that, for example, in a context like that? And, and, and given those circumstances, would theater still exist, albeit in another form? Well, I mean, let me take the first part of the question, which is addressed to me, and I think the rest, you know, is, 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 a, is a very interesting and open question. I mean, I think that you do have lineaments of, uh, of, of civil society, even in much more um, uh, tyrannical or hegemonic conditions. The question is, however, at some point, where the conflict will come and where the contradiction will come. And at that point, the institutions of a... Uh, of, 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 a, of a hegemony. Well, we have to make a distinction between a tyranny and a hegemony because a hegemony is a partially consensual mode of power. We, in some sense, consent to a hegemony. We may not like it, but we have nothing as an alternative to it, and we are ourselves, we ourselves put a hegemony in power. You know, so that's a much more partial, uh, a partial kind of condition. A hegemony does not prevent a civil society. In fact, what, it's, what, what an active, what act, active civil society institutions and organizations do in a hegemony is to push for greater democracy. And I think they're extreme, it's an extremely important operation. I think as far as, so I think there's not a huge contradiction, I mean, there is a contradiction there, but it can be a productive contradiction. I think, of course, as far as street theater, and I just, <clears throat> we know that there are times when street theaters have, uh, and, and, and such street acts have provoked brutal responses. Um, and whereas the same play may be in the theater, would have had the theater banned, there are times where the electrifying response to street theater has had people killed, almost for the same work. And I think that's the, a, a real problem. Because I'm not sure I fully followed the question about street theater. If you said, would theater continue to exist? I'm, I, I'm not sure I quite understood what you were asking that part. I, I can reply as best I can. But. No, the point, uh, uh, Professor Barber's point was, in an act of civil society, would theater continue to exist? And, well, so, and yeah. my, my point is, 
Well, first of all, let's determine what the lineaments of that act of society are, and I said, be it a democracy or no, not. Mine was only a half, uh, a, a half a joke, you know, I, in a perhaps, sense. And I, and I, and if I you have a transparent society, yeah. actually, you know, in very in conditions of complete transparency, if you imagined it, mm -hmm. sure. there would and be much less of the conflict that all literature provides mm -hmm. us with. It was only a yeah. no, throwaway. And I, no, and then it's a perfectly jocular thought experiment. Well, there would but remain still the oikos, right? <laughs> there would remain still the tragedies at home, which need to be written out, you know, and, yeah. and split laid out before us, right? Because they Which those is a lot of what the 19th the century novel is about. It's completely what it's about, yeah. Right. Other questions, please. Thank you. Hi. I wanted to follow up on that, a point that this uh, person made about the, um, the response um, to what extent it's fun or, or, or I found myself getting swept away, but, but at the same time, I looked at other people that were dancing, and I said, why are they dancing? This is upsetting. Um, but then I stopped myself, I sort of argued with myself, because I felt, by the end of the evening, I definitely felt very impassioned and angry, and I was sort of swept away by it. I didn't necessarily feel angry. You know, when I saw the pictures of Jafar Panahi, and the, uh, sort of the lights went up, I felt some anger about that, but I, I didn't quite know how to relate my feelings uh, uh, about Jafar Panahi and trying to do something, writing a postcard, which I did, to the struggle of Prometheus. So I was wondering how you conceive, and I was also thinking about, I also thought about um, what would a Greek experience, fifth century experience, have been. We ha obviously, we have no way of knowing that, but, but it certainly would have been a sacred um, context, which this kind of was, but I was wondering what elements of the Greek um, um, notions of, of fate and of the sacredness of theater you were wanting to bring up, and to what end? You know, I, I, I was really listening to Jackie talk about that conflicted response, and I think something Susanna said, I mean, we were dealing it with in rehearsal this afternoon, because you know, we're also crafts people in the theater. We're trying to modulate an evening in rhythm. And there's the first song, which is called In This Nothing Hell, which is the song that Force sings. And it's essentially the song where Prometheus is bound to the rock. And we got to the end of it and we thought, we, we had kind of like put a button on it last night. And no one applauded, but we did it because the first two previews, some people applauded. And it was this interesting thing of like, we don't want people to applaud that song. You know, you're, you, th th that's horrifying, that song. It's exactly what, you know, you, 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 you remarked on. Um, and then I was talking to, you know, the lighting designer. He's like, yeah, but it's Leah Delaria, and it's her big number, you know? Give her an applause. And it's this interesting, I mean, so, so it's complicated, and in the end, we, we did it m multiple ways this afternoon, and then we took it out. You know, there are things we can do in, in lighting, rhythm, and direction to to, to not let a applause happen, you know, that, that, to make it clear that this is not something we're like inviting the audience to react to. And then I was also talking, we have three guys in the company that are called groupies and they are uh, kind of extended members of the troupe and they do all these things in the audience. They move the ladders. I mean, they're so active and they sat with me at the end of the rehearsal right before I came here and they said, what do we do when someone starts to dance? I mean, they had these very same questions like, Someone's dancing during Loud Enough Without You, which is the song when the Daughters of the Ether are saying, you know, Prometheus. They're actually having a moment of doubt. They're like, the, the point is, don't cry out. You're going to bring problems for all of us. Be quiet. So they were saying, you know, that's actually a moment of tension. I mean, it's a moment of what I think Susanna said. We're asking the audience to put themselves, because what's the function of the Greek chorus, the audience? dialectic question, you know, how am I going to relate to this? The, I, I'm actually going through argument. You know, that's what you say about civil society, homie. I think, you know, what I crave in theater is for the audience not to be complacent. And what I, my fantasy of the Greek theater is at least they were engaging in an argument to the point that, you know, Sophocles and Aeschylus would go on street corners before their play was up and they'd present the argument of their play like a political speech, you know, like here's my campaign for my play, because this is the argument of my play, which we never think about doing in the theater. We're very passive, we come to see something, you know. But, um, you know, it, it, I, I think my only hope, you know, in, in, in the event is that 
because that song is a jam. You know, that song it happens to be like a really great song and I see people dancing to it. So I was talking with these guys like, what do you do? And in a way, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in freedom in the theater, not in dictating behavior. So if someone hears music and they, you know, there was someone last night who put her glass up in the air. She was like doing this and I was looking at her. I'm like, she's really not listening to the words maybe. But I thought, am I going to, I'm not going to, I don't want to squelch that behavior because maybe if she is in it, it can convert. That's always my, that's always my goal is that it's, a, it's like a journey. And, you know, we all come in with different agendas and different places and different ex life experiences and different professions and different moods. And my goal is what's going to happen over the course of the evening so that by the end, perhaps, we've gone through disorder to some kind of, you know, unity or, or feeling of something. So, so it, it can happen for different people at different times and maybe for someone it doesn't happen at all. I don't know. But then maybe when Jahar... Pahani's poster goes up, maybe they think, well, wait a minute, did I, was I really listening? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a process, and I talked to the cast about it, because, you know, they sang the opening number two nights ago, and I thought it had gotten too much, like, we have a great rock song, but, you know, they're singing about the hounds of law, you know, very much Abu Ghraib, like, very much these pictures we saw of dogs uh, at prisoners, and so it's, it's, I'm rambling, but it's a process of how we can be clearer in what the transmission is and the hope, the blind hope, of what we'll achieve through the transmission. But it's a process of, 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 of experience, actually, that I think is going to reveal itself over the course of the run, to be honest. I think we're going to learn what, what's going to evolve in, in the reaction, which to me at least is maybe the civil society, that we're going to have to contend with our reactions, our conflicts, Maybe you know. Maybe someone will get upset and start pushing that person who's dancing. Who's dancing? Maybe that's good. I don't know. You know, maybe that's what it means to have a mind and be reacting and being. But but maybe you know, Dan. Once you un with the music, you unleash that other affective side. Maybe th theater will always have a, perver a perversity which you shouldn't stop. A perverse response. Why would you want to stop that perversity? There may be somebody who, you know, I, I, it may not be my type of pleasure. And, and the thing is that there is always that pleasure. There is always, whether it's politically it's correct, incorrect, progressive, regressive, there is that pleasure. And if that woman was dancing to a song which was, was, was blood-curdling and terribly upsetting, well... You know, that's also what the theater does. It unleashes all kinds of things. And I think that's, that's absolutely essential. This is not a political uh, tract. This is not a meeting, uh, you know, a Quaker meeting. This is the theater. Well, I, I, I think I, maybe I slightly disagree with that. I mean, I think that I, I've got the, the, the play in front of me and the words are really, they're really unbelievable. And, I mean, unbelievably powerful, you know. They mess you up, they throw you down like a human carpet, they line you up, their rifles out, baby, you're the target, et cetera, et cetera. Bang you on, on your door, tear you out of your sleeper, splat your head, throw you into their Jeep. I mean, you know, it's, it's really, really powerful. Did you think at all about projecting the words or because I mean it is it is because the music is incredibly engrossing and the actors are I mean the 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 the, the production is so dynamic there's so much to look at you know you're not far from bored you're not even sort of quiet for a minute because there's so much going on did you think at all of sort of loading more onto the words maybe artificially like either by giving them or by by projecting them and and if you did think about it why did you decide not to do that? Well, I was talking about with the choreographer the other day about, you know, he said to me, did you ever think about super titling the words, you know? Um, and I actually was thinking recently, I have, we, have, we were so busy, we haven't had a chance, I thought, you know, maybe we could, you know, leave the, leave the lyrics. Because maybe it can't all happen at once, to your point. You know, the theater is something that we experience. And, I'm all for like, you know, I've, I've heard already several people saying I have to come back. 
And rather that being abnormal, I like that. Like, why can't that be the normal response? That I have to see it more than once. I didn't understand it all. Something sh shocked me, felt me, but maybe I didn't hear it. You know, maybe it's a process. So, so I think, you know, it's, 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 I think it was probably an aesthetic choice of not, you know, it was not part of the, yeah, not, not part of the kind of rock world that we were adapting with this play to have, you know, the, the lyrics there. Um, what I love is there's certain people already who've come to the show many times, even though we've only done it three times, and people are starting to, I see it in the audience, people are starting to sing along because they're adopting the language. And I, it, you were saying this to Serge today, what, what, what it will be when audience know this music. I mean, that, 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 that sort of an, you know, and that maybe then, I mean, Shirley Manson, who's a lead singer of Garbage, which is a very famous Scottish rock band, recorded one of our songs, The Hunger. It's an IO song. Stephen and Serge donated their creative, you know, rights to it, to Amnesty. All the proceeds are going to Amnesty. It's on iTunes. It was released yesterday. It was covered in Rolling Stone. I mean, you know, maybe people now all over the, talk about technology and, you know, democracy. That song now is all over the world. So who knows where in the world people now are adopting that song and the lyrics in that song, which are equally powerful. Um, Susanna wants to say something. I just something. wanted to uh, j just chime in on that, that uh, going back to your initial question of whether the Greeks knew the, this, this text, um, it would be very interesting, much as you know, people who would go to the opera read the libretto before and they study it so that they, their experience is enhanced that way. It's, it would be interesting to think about what if one posted <laughs> some of or all of these lyrics so that they could be um, learned and studied and recited and it does become part of our, our you know, a common text. It would be very interesting. Yeah, but then uh, where, the, where would the spontaneity be? I mean, the fact is that these are not words to be read. These were words put to music. You were giving them, true. You were giving them that extra charge of music. So it's no point in them becoming docile goody goodies and saying, you know, yeah, we are, we're totally, they, they enjoy it. They, they, it. It goes in different ways, you know. I think if we took perversity out of the theater, we'd have no theater at all. I've not said that at all. I've not said that at all. I've just said, that spontaneity of response in a, you can read the opera, you can know the music backwards, you can know the score. When you're there, the performance does something to you. And you may not act, you may not act in the way in which you thought you would act before you went to the performance. And the next time you hear it, you may act differently. But that moment is absolutely precious. That's right. That's that's quite right. I, correct. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Any other questions? Homie, I think we actually need to prepare the stage for the show tonight. So, I'd like thank to thank you all very now. much for being here. Thank this. You.